Good morning, and thank you for coming to this uh, first, our organizational meeting of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, and also thanks uh, to those who are joining this by webcast, uh, which is available uh, at our, through our site at www.supportthevoter.com. Uh, our order of business, .gov, actually, supportthevoter.gov. Uh, our first order of business, or our order of business today, um, begins with the swearing in of the commissioners. We were all sworn in uh, previously uh, by phone, uh, but we are resuming that uh, here today more formally and in public. And uh, we'll also talk a little bit more about uh, the balance of the agenda here before the swearing in takes place. So let me turn this to my co-chair, Ben Ginsburg. Thank you, Bob, and welcome, everyone. Uh, what we'd like to do today is to talk a bit about uh, our charge from the president for this commission, uh, as well as our goals and objectives. We'll go over the dates, locations, uh, and format for our future public meetings, uh, which we'll hear from election officials, from academicians and experts in the field, and from the public. Uh, then we will uh, hear a presentation from Nate Persley, our research director on the, the issues that we'll be looking at and the research in the area now. Uh, then we'll talk some more about the commission's website, which we hope to make a very integral part of our process. And lastly, we'll describe the next steps from the commission. So with that, uh, and here to swear us in, is the Acting Administrator of the General Services Administra Administration, Dan Taglarini. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. morning. I want to thank uh, uh, co-chairs, uh, Ben Ginsberg and Robert Bauer, for agreeing to lead this uh, important commission. I want to thank all of the commissioners for volunteering of your own personal time uh, uh, giving your time to this important issue. I want to thank uh, Mark and Monique uh, of the GSA staff and the entire GSA staff that will be supporting the commission. The General Services Administration gets to support activities such as this uh, under, the, uh, under the title General. Uh, it is among the things that we do is providing the uh, opportunities and the systems and the support for important work such as this to be done. And there's little work that's as important as what you're doing uh, to help us um, explore reforms in the way we engage in the fundamental activity of a representative democracy, and that is running our elections. So with that charge, I'd ask you all to please stand and raise your right hand. And when I say insert name here, please insert your name rather than repeating insert name here. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people do that. I, insert your name, I do solemnly swear, do solemnly, solemnly swear, swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office. Duties of the office on which I am about to enter. On which, which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Good luck. We thought we would begin um, before proceeding to the balance of the business to have uh, each of the commissioners uh, introduce themselves briefly. I'll begin. Uh, I'm Bob Bauer. I've been involved uh, with election law, uh, mostly in private practice, uh, at the law firm of Perkins Coie for over 30 years, and have represented uh, a wide range of clients, uh, political party organizations, candidates, tax exempt groups, and current representations include uh, the general counsel of the Democratic National Committee. And I'll now turn over uh, to Gen Ginsburg the responsibility to identify himself. <laughs> Why, thank you, Bob. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm Ben Ginsburg. Uh, I've been practicing mostly on the, or exclusively on the Republican side of the ledger for slightly less than Bob being slightly less youthful, or more youthful uh, than he. Uh, I practice at the Patton Boggs firm, uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to working. Brian? 
Good morning. Better. My name is Brian Britton. I'm an executive of 15 years at Disney, um, specifically the parks and resort segment. We know a thing or two about lines uh, down there. Uh, prior to that, I was a naval flight officer uh, in the back seat of the mighty P-3 Orion. And I just wanted to say I'm extremely proud to serve. Uh, Joe Echeverra is the chief executive officer of Deloitte. He could not be with us today, uh, but Joe has uh, joined, uh, been with Deloitte for 30 years. He is currently uh, uh, basically the chief uh, U.S. executive officer of that firm, and he will be joining us for future meetings. He is also a graduate of the University of Miami and a trustee there, and that will become relevant in just a moment. Trey? I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Prior to that, I served two terms as Secretary of State of Kentucky, and during that time I was the president of the National Association of Secretaries of States and also the chair of the Republican Association of Secretary of States. And, and like Brian, it's a real honor to serve. Morning, Larry Lomax. Uh, someone on a committee has to have actually put on elections, and I'm the grunt of the group. Uh, I'm from Las Vegas, been put, putting on the elections there for the last 15 years. Prior to that, I was an Air Force officer and pilot for 30 years, um, listed in the Air Force on the day I graduated from Stanford. Michelle Coleman Mays. In my role as general counsel in several institutions, I know what it means to try to influence public behavior in a positive way, particularly at the New York Public Library now when dealing with folks that are new to this country. You understand how important the right to vote is. And anything we can do to get more people to vote is in the right direction. Good morning, I'm Ann McGeehan, and uh, for 22 years I worked uh, in the Texas Secretary of State's office, 16 of those years as state election director, um, saw lots of changes, implemented NVRA, HAVA, and other interesting um, federal changes and state changes. Last year I left uh, to go to the Texas County and District Retirement System, which has been a really pleasant change and a new challenge, but I'm very honored to serve on this committee commission, and I'm looking forward to the work. Good morning, I'm Tammy Patrick. I'm the Federal Compliance Officer for Maricopa County uh, in Arizona. It's the greater Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, everyone always wants to um, know what exactly a Federal Compliance Officer is and does, and my job is to um, ensure that voters have um, an access to the ballot and overcome any obstacles that they foresee. And that means basically providing information in alternative formats, minority languages, and ensuring that our military and overseas voters um, are well served. And it is truly an honor to be here this morning. Good morning. My name is Chris Thomas. I'm from the state of Michigan. I'm the director of elections there. I've served in that capacity since 1981. I cut my teeth here in Washington in 1974 in campaign finance administration with both the clerk of the house and with the Federal Election Commission. It's an honor to be here, an honor to be appointed, and look forward to making a very positive impact on the conduct of elections in this nation. Um, Nate Persley, I'm uh, the research director of the commission, and I'm Currently, Professor of Law and Political Science at Columbia Law School, at least for the next 10 days, and then I'll be at Stanford. Um, and I've been working in the area of election law and administration for the last 15 years or so as a political scientist, a law professor, a lawyer, uh, and with many other hats on. Thank you, everyone. We'd also like to introduce Mark Nabauer from the General Services Administration, who is our designated federal officer for this commission. Um, let me tell you a bit about our charge goals and objectives of the commission. As you know, the president introduced the creation of this commission in his State of the Union address. The objective he set out was to improve the voting experience for all qualified American voters and for this commission to offer a series of best practices uh, to improve specific areas where barriers have been experienced. The executive order signed by the president on March 28th of this year, uh, and that's included on the commission's website, uh, sets out the topics the commission will consider. The issues spelled out in the executive order, the ones that the commission will consider, are first, the number, location, management, operation, and design of polling places, 
Secondly, voting accessibility for uniformed and overseas voters. Third, the training, recruitment, and number of poll workers. Fourth is the efficient management of voter rolls and poll books. Fifth is voting machine capacity and technology. Sixth is ballot uh, simplicity and voter education. Seven is voting accessibility for individuals with disabilities, limited English proficiency, and other special needs. Eight is the management of issuing and processing provisional ballots in the polling place on election day. Nine are the issues presented by the administration of absentee ballot programs. Tenth is the adequacy of contingency plans for natural disasters and other emergencies that may disrupt elections. Uh, and lastly, are other issues related to efficient administration uh, that we see in the course of, of our deliberations. Uh, in developing this list, we recognize that a number of issues are best left to elected officials. The Commission's charge and our goal is presenting a series of best practices in these areas. We will not be producing legislative recommendations. And the, the crux of what we're going to be attempting to do here is to take the best information available, the best research, uh, the experience and testimony of those who've been involved with elections, the best data, and fashion them into best practices uh, that really treat uh, election law in the terms that Ben has described it, the issues that have been laid out for us in this mandate as matters for public administration. Uh, by no means a partisan exercise, in fact, uh, to the contrary, a public administrative exercise where it would be possible for uh, anyone of, of, of any party or those not affiliated with any party to, ag to agree fundamentally on the importance of um, opening up the franchise and assuring that unnecessary impediments in no way limit uh, access to the polling place. So we're going to be looking to find common ground and find common ground on the basis of the best possible analysis uh, reached in a thoroughgoing analytic fashion. Our further business here this morning is to talk about at least one aspect by which we are going to be, one mechanism by which we're going to be collecting this information, uh, and that is through a public meetings process, a public meetings process around the country that enables us to hear from election officials, uh, from experts, and from citizens of affected communities about the voting experience and their perspective on, on the issues that we should be covering. Uh, we have already announced uh, a first public hearing on June 28th in Miami at the University of Miami in Coral Gables. And I wanted to, uh, on behalf of the commission, also identify the other dates and locations for additional public meetings around the country. On August 8th, we will have a public hearing in Denver, Colorado. On September 4th, we'll have a public hearing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And on September 20th, we will have a public hearing in the state of Ohio uh, at a location still to be uh, determined. Final arrangements are being made, and we will announce that uh, somewhat later. Well, let me reiterate what Bob said about this being a nonpartisan exercise and one really designed to, uh, to improve the ability of qualified Americans to cast their votes. Uh, the public sessions uh, that Bob mentioned, we are structuring to try and maximize uh, that goal. So we see it really in three parts. Um, first, we'll be hearing from those who do the actual hard work of administering elections on the local, county, and state level. We'll then blend that with the work of those conducting research in this area, uh, including academicians and members of think tanks. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, we'll spend the afternoon of the public meetings hearing from uh, groups all across the spectrum, from citizens, who wish, to, uh, who wish to tell us about the work that we're undertaking. Um, that's the format. It really is designed to, to reflect the merging of the practical uh, people who put on elections with the best research in the area with what citizens have to tell us about their voting experience uh, experiences. Um, 
the, the, we certainly want to encourage everyone who wishes to address us to come to the meetings that, that Bob outlined. Uh, and we also want to encourage people, recognizing that not everyone can get to, to those four cities, to, uh, to use our website. Uh, we see that as, in, in essence, uh, an additional hearing for us. Uh, and we, we urge submissions of information that the members of the commission should be, um, should be reviewing. We see that every bit as valuable to us as in-person statements. Beyond some of the, the, the key procedural points uh, we wanted to make, uh, that the commission wanted to present publicly today about how it's going to proceed, we also thought it would be useful to have a threshold discussion of the state of research currently into the various issues that we've been asked to examine uh, through the president's executive order. Uh, that presentation is going to be made by our senior research director, uh, Nate Persley, who introduced himself just a few minutes ago. We feel exceptionally fortunate, uh, particularly at a time in transition uh, in his life where he's moving from New York to California, from Columbia to Stanford, uh, that in the middle of that chaos, Nate has been willing to take upon uh, himself this very, and, and on behalf of the commission, this uh, uh, exceptionally important responsibility uh, to direct uh, research for the commission and ensure that we have the information available to inform uh, our deliberations. Um, Nate uh, is going to present that research um, overview now. Uh, because of the layout of the room, the screen being behind us, the commission's gonna step down for a minute and take seats in the front row so that we can see it in the same way that you're seeing it. I should mention that the PowerPoint uh, presentation that Nate is about to deliver uh, is going to be available, posted also for review, either by those who haven't seen it or others later. Um, who would like to review it one more time uh, on the website at uh, www.supportthevoter.gov. Thank you. Nate? Thank you. I should say it's also good to have the commission in front because now I can give this PowerPoint by way of Socratic method. I thought that that would be uh, useful. I often say that I'm, I'm, depending on the day, I'm either a law professor or a political scientist. You can tell which one I am because when I'm a law professor, I have opinions without data. When I'm a political scientist, I have data without opinions. Uh, and, and for the most part, this is going to be my role as political scientist. As uh, Bob and Ben mentioned, I am the research director, which means that I'm directing a, a, a research effort that includes many, many other uh, people who are around the country and who are experts uh, in election law and election administration. Um, and you will see many of them uh, in the hearings uh, throughout the summer. The, you can view this presentation as a bit of the trailer to the summer movie, hopefully a little bit different than, say, World War Z or something like that, but that it'll give you a sense of the kinds of research that our uh, experts would, will be presenting throughout the summer and other, uh, that group is continually evolving and growing. So in a half hour or less, I'm going to give you a primer on election administration, a review of the literature, and a strategy for uh, further research. Um, let me start with the good news, which is that we have come a long way since the watershed moment of the 2000 election and uh, the debate over the Help America Vote Act uh, uh, subsequent to that. Um, the immediate focus after the 2000 election was on, particularly on ballot machines, on voting technology, and on the problem of residual votes, uh, most glamorized by the uh, punch card ballots uh, in, the, in the Florida uh, race in 2000. Uh, and the issue for, that many people spent a lot of time on originally was the issue of residual votes, meaning ballots that are cast but that are not counted. And one, the good story over the last 13 years or so is that we have really uh, done a good job as a country in, in reducing through uh, technology the number of residual votes, the numbers of ballots that are cast that uh, do not end up registering a vote. So that in uh, the 2008 election, 
we've pretty much pushed residual votes down to around 1%, um, which is about as, uh, it's probably approaching the lower bound of uh, what, what is possible with, with technology. However, problems remain. New problems have developed, old problems uh, remain. So despite these technological improvements, votes have gotten lost in the system uh, at other points in the process, whether it's because of registration problems that prevent voters from voting, wait times that we've heard a lot about uh, in the 2012 and earlier elections that burden voters and discourage turnout, military, overseas, absentee ballots that are never received, that are not correctly or timely cast, that are not counted, uh, and provisional ballots uh, which also have uh, grown over the, the, since of course the Help America Vote Act that would fail to be counted. In addition, we haven't done away with the ballot design problems that often cause voters to misvote or undervote. And uh, language difficulties and unaccommodated disabilities also lead to uh, many voters not being able to vote at the polls. In the executive order, in trying to think of the multiple areas of law and administration that, that Bob and Ben mentioned in uh, the introductory remarks, the, the executive order does set forth two goals. To ensure that, uh, to promote the efficient administration of elections, to ensure that eligible voters have the opportunity to cast their ballots without undue delay, and to improve the experience of voters facing other obstacles in casting their ballots, such as members of the military, overseas voters, voters with disabilities, and voters with limited English proficiency. So you could think of these goals as, as looking at access accessibility by the general population on the one hand, and then dealing with accessibility issues uh, of particular uh, populations on the other. And if you plug in some of the other topics from the executive order that, that were, were listed, to further that first goal, to ensure that eligible voters have the opportunity to cast their ballots without undue delay, we look at the issues of management of polling places, poll workers, and voter rolls, voting machine capacity and technology, ballot simplicity, and voter education, provisional ballots. And then for discrete populations, we're looking at the members of the military and overseas voters, voters with disabilities, voters with limited English proficiency, absentee voters, and victims of natural disasters and emergencies. So that's one way to bring uh, some co coherence to the uh, topics that are in the executive order. But I want to begin by talking about the data and research challenges in this area. Because we don't have the data set that we would all want, which is we don't have a census of the election experience of all eligible voters in the US. Okay? Um, we have a highly decentralized and spotty data provision system at the local level on even the most basic questions of American elections. Um, there isn't a national repository or a national standard even for uh, basic questions of election data. And in fact, it's sometimes difficult even to define and assess the effect of a single factor in what are geographically variant election ecosystems. That the polling place in Nevada might be different than a polling place in Maricopa County, than in Miami, than in New York City. That how we describe the categories of things like provisional ballots or absentee ballots really will depend on location and how uh, the local administrators are collecting that information. So since we don't have that census of, of uh, the election experience, we, re we rely on sample surveys of the population, such as the Census Current Population Survey or the Cooperative Congressional Election Survey, or the survey of the performance of the American elections, performance of the American elections, which I'll, uh, all of these I'll, I'll uh, have charts from in, in the presentation. But these are naturally going to be samples of the general population of thousands of people, but not millions of people. And so the ability to make inferences about local specific problems will be hampered by, of course, the size of the population that is being sampled. So in addition to those sample surveys, we have surveys of election administrators, the indispensable surveys from the Election Assistance Commission, such as their Election Administration and Voting Survey and their survey dealing with uniformed and overseas voters and, um, and with compliance for the National Voter Registration Act. That is, uh, which, I mean, that, that survey, which has been around for around 10 years, is uh, really the, the, the only source of information 
on the national level for so many of the questions that we're dealing with uh, as a commission. And then we have some state-specific data sets and some data that will be provided to us and has been provided to us by national associations of election administrators, which have, uh, it's an alphabet soup of organizations, IACRIOT, NAS, NASED, Election Center, all of those uh, organizations um, do some kinds of survey research and data collection. In addition to that, we will have some data concerning incident reports that groups uh, tally on election day or the campaigns do. And I don't want to knock this last research category. We tend to focus on the numbers, but we're going to be spending a lot of time uh, dealing with interviews with election administrators, the hearing process, and getting a lot of feedback from uh, individuals who've been administering these elections. But in many respects, the, the triggering event for our research is were the wait times that voters have been experiencing in uh, recent elections. And there is here also a good news, bad news story, which is that most voters do not need to vote. Do not need, most voters uh, do not need to wait in order to vote. Um, but rather, that in for a subsection of the population, which is to say millions of people, they need to vote, they need to wait to vote for sometimes two or more hours, sometimes extending into eight hours or more. And so, as Charles Stewart and his survey, The Performance of the American Elections, show, there's great state variation in wait times that you can see in the chart on the left. Um, but focusing on the average wait time of voters will uh, obscure the severe instances that we all saw on the television and that have been reported since then. Although uh, roughly 4% of Americans are waiting uh, more than one hour, um, of that group that's waiting uh, more than one hour, half of them are waiting for over two hours, which translates into millions of people who will be waiting, uh, who have been waiting in, in elections for um, extensive periods of time. Now, who waits longer to vote? And we have some idea based on the survey of performance of American elections as to who waits longer to vote. As it turns out, early voters uh, have to wait longer to vote. Uh, those in urban jurisdictions, racial minorities, as well as people who live in jurisdictions where the wait times were long four years earlier. And the reason it's important to em emphasize that point, because one of the questions we'll be wrestling with is to what extent are the, uh, is the incidence of wait times a function of lightning strikes, right, which is sort of random events that, that simply are going to be crippling polling places that, you know, lead to problems, or are they systemic issues which plague the same areas of geography time and again? Now, if you look to queuing theory outside the area of, of election administration, uh, those management experts will often talk about three causes for long lines, that either Large numbers of people are, shot, are arriving to vote at the same time. There are too few points of service. There's, and, and then the length of time it takes to commit the transaction, in this case to vote, uh, is excessive. In looking at the factors that, in the executive order that bear on those three categories, um, with respect to the first, the large number of people arriving to vote at the same time, it may depend on the length of the voting period. It may depend on the length and schedule uh, for voting on election days, on alternative ways that Americans can vote. And with respect to two points of serve, uh, too few points of service, the polling places, poll workers, poll books, and voting machines uh, and ballots, if, they are un if the resources are not there in order to uh, commit to the large number of people who that show up, then you'll have long lines. And then finally, uh, the the factors that determine the length of time it takes to vote uh, are the time, of course, it takes to check someone in, confirm registration status, print, distribute a ballot, vote the ballot, and confirm the vote. And all of that can be affected by the length, complexity, and usability of the ballot, the inaccuracies in the poll books and the registration lists, and any other uh, voter and poll worker confusion. So what Charles Stewart in the survey of the performance of the American election uh, asked was, well, when do people uh, attribute, when do they wait? Is it at the front end of the process before they get to vote, or is it while they're waiting to vote? Okay, and so uh, for the most part, 
whether you're talking about people who don't have to wait all that long or those who have to wait over an hour, um, most of the waiting happens before you actually uh, get the ballot. So it's people who are waiting in line in order to check in and to have their, um, uh, and waiting to get the ballot. It is true, as I'll mention later, that some technologies are going to cause longer wait times than others once you do get the ballot, right? So naturally, if there are certain technologies that um, are limited in capacity, like electronic voting machines, all other things being equal, it might, uh, a, a scarcity of voting machines will, of course, lead to longer wait times once you've gotten the ballot. Um, but for the most part, people are waiting in order to uh, get into the, uh, have the opportunity to vote. And that's going to be a function of several things, the poll workers in the polling places. We have over 878,000 poll workers in the U.S. and 43 uh, reporting states in the EAC surveys, 132,000 uh, poll polling places. They vary considerably in their training. Um, it is harder to recruit poll workers in some jurisdictions than others. Um, there are roughly 45% of jurisdictions report difficulty in recruiting sufficient poll workers, and uh, ju jurisdictions vary considerably in all of the resource allocation decisions that, that are coming poll, uh, poll workers' way, whether you're talking about pay, how much time they're on the job, et cetera. But one of the critical factors in moving voters through the process is the accuracy of the uh, poll books and the registration lists. And so Stephen Salbeher and Eitan Hirsch have, have done an analysis of uh, the registration lists across the country, and they find roughly 10% or so of, uh, of the registration lists have names that are inaccurate. For one reason or another, whether it's their missing address information, whether uh, the dead voters, uh, voters who have moved, that on average, you will have about 10% of the, the rolls are inaccurate, but that varies considerably, it varies considerably across time and, and space. So that different states, depending on the year, could have much higher rates of what we call deadwood on the registration list. Um, and then after uh, a series of measures may reduce that deadwood considerably. But depending on the usability and accuracy of the registration list and poll books, uh, that is what feeds into uh, polling place management. Because if the registration lists are inaccurate, you have longer waits as poll workers struggle to match names. You may have more provisional ballots if names don't match the list. You could have a greater likelihood of later unmailed absentee ballots if the addresses are inaccurate and they're going to be uh, returned back and forth. <clears throat> so once you get through the check-in process, you then confront uh, the voting machine or the, the voting process. And as I said at the beginning, we have uh, great, made great strides uh, in transforming the election system from one that was primarily dealing with, say, 19th century technology to uh, ones that are at least in the 20th century. Um, and the graph that I have up here shows the shift from the 1980s, and I, since Kim Brace is in the audience, I should say most of this is from, from election data services, that um, the shift in the elimination of punch card ballots from the 1980s and, and 2000, um, and for the most part now the elimination of lever machines, which, which my current state of New York uh, uh, just got rid of, and the shift toward electronic voting machines, which is the second uh, bar up uh, on, on the top, the gray bar, uh, and optical scan technology. And so, as I said at the, at the outset, this did lead to a decrease in the number of residual votes, but it has been a mixed blessing um, because it also shows that there, is, uh, there are certain longer wait times with other uh, more advanced technologies. Again, if there's a scarce number of machines, then of course uh, more people will have to wait in order to get an individual machine. But again, that will also be contingent on all kinds of other factors in the election ecosystem. Now, while we've made great strides in uh, ballot technology, and I said not without all kinds of other mixed blessings, whether you're talking about security or, or uh, the issues that I just mentioned on wait times, um, that 
these, these advances can also be offset, not just in the types of technology that you're using, but in the design of the ballot. Okay? We, we famously remember the Palm Beach butterfly ballot, but that's just one extreme case of a more ubiquitous problem of uh, confusing and otherwise difficult uh, ballot uh, designs that, um, uh, that are going to lead to lost votes or lead to people to misvote or overvote. The, the NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology in 2006, looked at ballot length. The average general election ballots has 14 contests plus uh, referenda. Typical ballots have between 11 and 90 contests, including referenda. Most items on the ballot are local. Um, the, the word count and reading level, on average, each referendum is, is about 100 to 150 words long uh, and written without regard to reading level, they find. And uh, as some have noted, particularly in the context of uh, absentee ballots, we have uh, ballot design problems that lead to lost votes, where uh, people uh, don't put the signature in the right place, they uh, don't fold it the correct way, there are thing information that's missing that leads uh, to lost votes. Um, as Dana Chisnell, a usability expert who uh, we've been talking to, has, has emphasized, um, when there are certain problems on the ballot, then, you le then there are certain problems in the vote. Where if you have split contests across columns, there will be an overvote. Responses on both sides of um, the ballot of names, you'll, you'll lead to uh, overvoting. Um, problems with the formatting, the instructions. We're having multiple contests on the same screen if you're using an electronic voting machine. Each one of these flaws in the design uh, will lead to voters making mistakes that could be corrected. One way to try to combat um, some of these mistakes is through uh, additional efforts at voter education, whether it's mailing out uh, sample ballots uh, or other types of education. I will say that I, this is one area where I think we as political scientists have not done enough research, which is to look really at uh, the question of what types of voter education materials work. Um, we have good data on what the state websites look like. And so I'll just put that up, up here. Um, where, so if you look at your state's election website, you will be able to find in 22% of them, you'll be able to, to vote online, actually probably more now. Um, and not vote online, that you'll be able to register online and manage your registration. I, almost all of them, you'll be able to find your polling place. Um, but on other questions, such as confirming whether your absentee ballot is count, counted or provisional vote is counted, um, only a minority of states provide that service. So states vary, and localities vary considerably in the kind of information that they transmit to voters through the internet or through mail. So now once you've gone through, the, you've, you've uh, shown up to vote, and uh, you, you meet the person who is, the poll worker who is registering you, if there is a problem if in your registration status, the Help America Vote Act says that you still have the opportunity to cast a provisional ballot. Um, these provisional ballots are both a solution and highlight other problems. Um, as I said, they, they ensure that if there is a registration difficulty that they, um, uh, you would still be able to vote. But high rates of casting and rejection uh, may signify something that's awry in the system. Um, we had. 2.1 million provisional ballots that were cast in 2008. 62% uh, of them uh, were counted, which was 1.7% of all uh, votes that are counted. But four states account for about two-thirds of the provisional ballots, Arizona, California, New York, and Ohio. And, and by singling those out, I don't mean, I mean to emphasize the first point, which is it doesn't, that the idea of provisional ballots does not necessarily translate into a problem and that the problem of provisional ballots is geographically contingent. And by that, I mean that different states give out provisional ballots for different reasons. And what is a provisional ballot in, a, in each state uh, really depends on uh, the reasons that voters cast provisional ballots. So for example, in states that allow for permanent absentee voters, such as Arizona and California, you may get a higher rate of uh, provisional ballots because when voters show up at the, at the polls, when they are registered as provisional, as, as permanent absentee voters, um, they will often end up casting provisional ballots. Similarly, states that had provisional ballots long before the Help America Vote Act and therefore have all kinds of reasons why people might cast provisional ballots, uh, those uh, states have about four times as many provisional ballots cast as others. 
So why are provisional ballots rejected? For the most part, it's because of uh, the voter not being registered in the state. Uh, sometimes it's because ballots are cast in the wrong precinct. Sometimes it's because of uh, other problems in uh, ballot administration. Now, moving from the issue of general accessibility um, and, and the, the factors that feed into long lines on Election Day, uh, now I'll talk a little bit about the discrete groups of voters that face obstacles in casting their ballots, focusing, as the executive order does, on members of the military, overseas voters, absentee ballots, voters with disabilities and limited language proficiency, and then um, uh, victims of natural disasters and emergencies. When it comes to the military, there are uh, heightened problems that also afflict absentee voters in general. They have difficulty registering at the correct address. They are twice as likely uh, to experience registration problems as the general population. Many of them, a high share of the military are registered, but because they move so frequently, they're often registered at the wrong address. And because of that, they, it, it historically has been the case that it's been difficult to receive, uh, for them to receive ballots on time. So in 2008, before what's known as the MOVE Act, 17% of reg registered active duty military said they requested an absentee ballot but didn't receive it. In addition to difficulty getting the ballots historically, uh, there's been difficulty in casting them. Um, and so turnout among the military uh, varies depending on the estimate that you look at, whether you look at the uh, military that are overseas or whether you're looking at um, domestic military and de depending on which denominator you use. But it's safe to say that the turnout rate among the military is lower than the general population. So in addition to having difficulty in receiving the ballots, in, in getting registered and receiving ballots and casting the ballots, um, because they are often stationed overseas, it's difficult to get the ballot uh, returned on time. So while 91% of the general population, this again is before the MOVE Act, returned uh, absentee ballots, only 62% of the military uh, personnel were able to return it on time. Um, and because of all of the issues dealing with registration and, and absentee votes generally, uh, military votes are, are, are going to have higher uh, rates where they are not going to be counted. As I mentioned, though, the MOVE Act, which Congress passed uh, after the 2008 election, did a lot to get the uh, states to get ballots to the military on time. And so while uh, if you look at the 2008 election of those who were unable to vote, Almost 50% of military or UOCAVA voters, which is uniformed and overseas uh, voters, said they had not received um, the ballot on time or they, or they missed the deadline. That uh, number dropped by about 14 percentage points by 2010. And so we've made great strides in that front end of the process of getting uh, military voters the vote. It is still the case, though, that we have uh, you know, quite a few ballots that are mailed out to military voters that end up uh, not being returned. Um, uh, so that in 2010 of, of mil uniform services, you had 335,000 roughly votes that were mailed out, 107,000 uh, that were cast. And so despite some of these great strides, again, this is there is a good news, bad news story here as well, there uh, remain significant obstacles. First, that there's confusion among election officials even after the MOVE Act as to whether voters must re-register after each election. The installation voting assistance offices, the IVAOs, um, the, in the Inspector General's report, they were unable to contact about half of those installations uh, when they tried to. The federal right in absentee ballot, which uh, is sort of a fail-safe for these uh, overseas and military voters. Uh, states are inconsistent as to whether this uh, constitutes a application for registration in addition to a fail-safe uh, for voting. And there's still uh, uh, low awareness among the military and overseas population of the existence of this federal right, uh, right in absentee ballot. The issue of, of overseas and military voters, some, some of the problems that plague them is a subset of uh, the issues that deal with absentee ballots. And I should say by way of introduction to the topic of absentee ballots, that simultaneous to the great strides that we've been making in the area of voting technology, there's also been, as I'll show you, this parallel increase 
in the uh, rates of absentee balloting. And as a result of that, for example, in California, where they have eliminated punch card ballots and moved to uh, more uh, advanced machinery for voting, um, the lost votes that were eliminated through the uh, advances in technology have now been regained through the absentee ballot process. This is according to Charles Stewart and Mike Alvarez. Because of the susceptibility of absentee ballots to all kinds of errors, and just to give you a sense of what that is, I have this uh, uh, chart from Charles Stewart up on the screen, that you can lose an absentee ballot uh, at the request stage, at the validation stage, at the, at when you're receiving a ballot in order to vote, how you mark the ballot, how it's returned, and how uh, it is then validated at the end. So this greater number of opportunities for absentee ballots to slip through the system has been a trend that has been increasing while at the same time lost votes through advances in technology have been decreasing. And so as uh, everyone who's been paying attention to American elections in recent years realizes, there has been a, a steady uptick in the number of absentee and early voting, so that roughly a quarter to, uh, or over 30% over of uh, votes that were cast in the 2008 election were cast absentee, um, or I should say cast absentee or early, that absentee voting uh, is roughly a quarter of the population, uh, if you look at the 2012 as well. But as uh, Charles Stewart estimates in 2008 election, about 7.6 7 million votes, absentee votes, were lost somewhere in the process. People who wanted to vote absentee, but ended up not being able to do so. Um, and why is that? Well, because there's greater potential for design errors, as I mentioned, uh, with absentee ballots. Um, and in addition, absentee voting doesn't just affect the absentee voters because of the problems dealing with permanent absentee voters, people who are permanently registered to be absentee voters. Um, that can also affect polling place lines and the number of provisional ballots that we have on election day. The one other, uh, the, the other two groups that are discreetly recognized in the executive order are voters uh, who with disabilities and voters with limited uh, language proficiency. Um, it is true that among voters with disabilities, they would all things, uh, as compared to the general population, they would prefer uh, to vote by mail. And of course, the disability community is a is a diverse uh, and varied group. But it is still the case that a majority of them, a substantial majority, would like to vote uh, in the polling place. There is a gap in turnout among disabled voters of, depending on, on who you look at and uh, what, uh, what study, between four and 21 percentage points uh, in the surveys over the last 20 years. Um, there are, in 2008, according to Lisa Schur, there are three million disabled non-voters. Um, some of that is explained by the standard features that we use to predict turnout. Um, but others are explained by barriers to voting by the disabled community. 73.7% of polling places had some barrier to accessibility for voters in disability, with disabilities in 2008. 50% uh, of polling places had one or more potential impediments in the path uh, from the parking area to the building entrance. Um, in, the, in surveys that were done over the last year, in all areas of sort of accessibility, um, the difficulties reported by uh, disabled voters uh, is uh, much greater than uh, those with no disability. The final uh, discrete group of voters that are covered in the executive are those with limited English proficiency. Here too, while we have uh, some general information about voters who face language difficulties in the polling place, voters who speak, uh, whose Eng English is not their first language. Um, this is also an area where we need further research. We know uh, that somewhere between 1.4 and 1.7% of voters cite difficulties with English as the reason for uh, failing to register to vote. Um, we also know that voters uh, whose first language is not English uh, have higher rates of provisional balloting for one reason or another. Um, and on average, officials in jurisdictions with high uh, shares of language uh, minorities underestimate the number of people in their jurisdiction uh, who need language assistance. 
So I've covered the, the general issues of general accessibility and, and the discrete populations. One area that I haven't covered is natural disasters. And in part, that's because we really have very little political science research on uh, preparation for natural disasters. And so with that topic as well as the others, let me just outline the strategy for further research that we'll be doing uh, with the commission. So as the commission co-chairs mentioned, we'll be having four hearings around the country starting next week in Miami my home city, I should mention, uh, which is why you can figure out how I became an election law professor. Um, uh, four hearings around the country to gather input uh, from the public with particular need concerning areas about which little research exists, such as natural disasters, as well as um, the other areas that were covered. We'll be going to meetings around the country, the, the IACRIOT, NAS, NASED election center meetings in order to uh, meet with election officials, as well as uh, meeting with interest groups, stakeholders, and experts uh, outside of those formal meetings. Um, there will be new survey data that will come up over the summer. Um, the Election Assistance Commission's NVRA report will be coming out in a week or so. Um, and we will be uh, gathering more data over the summer. And this is also a plea for those of you on the web <laughs> who uh, have access to additional data sets that are not uh, publicly available or which we may not know about, please send those uh, or make us aware of those uh, data sets so that we can analyze them as well. And that is, uh, by way of conclusion, uh, highlighting the role of the website in general, because as the co-chairs mentioned, that is going to be one of the main ways that we interact with the public, get information and feedback, uh, plug in the data holes that we don't, uh, in areas that we currently don't have research, and a way for us to uh, continually vet the kind of research that, that we're putting out there. And so we have six months or so to, to do this research. Um, and so we'll be ex examining all the existing data that, that is out there, but uh, we look to you to help us uh, in this research effort as well. Thank you very much, Nate. Excellent presentation. Um, let me reiterate what Nate just said about the website and what an important component of the Commission's work that we plan on it uh, being. Uh, we hope it to be a robust presence. Uh, it currently lists all the issues that Nate discussed and we mentioned that the Commission will be considering. We'd urge uh, all interested persons to take a a close look at that. Uh, we do want to include postings um, of all the statements submitted to us either at the, at the public meetings we'll be having uh, or as uh, people want to submit them to us. We, we see it really as a place for continued discussion of the Commission and its work. Uh, all our meeting notices will be published there all comments and submissions to us uh, will be uh, posted there as well. So again, we really do see it as uh, an additional hearing to what we'll be conducting around the country. So uh, we'll, we'll conclude this morning with a, a following uh, brief comment about next steps. The commission is uh, going to be in Florida next week. We'll begin the public hearing process. Uh, I think what you've heard today is a very strong appeal to all those who are following the work of the Commission and who've been doing this kind of work over the years, uh, voters, experts, election officials, to uh, please help us um, ferret out the information that we need. It is uh, unfortunately always the case that uh, between elections, well, the attention that's paid to these issues tends to lag. Uh, and then elections come along, problems develop, and. Uh, attention is renewed, but again, only sometimes for, for a short period of time. Our goal is for the period of time in which we're going to be working on this project uh, to uh, keep attention very active on this issue and to 
take advantage of the moment to draw the best information, the best advice, the best testimony we can from members of the public across the country and from those who have been deeply involved uh, in looking at the administration of elections or assisting with the administration of elections. The timetable um, is, uh, as you know, a short one uh, in some sense, which is uh, we have months, but not that many months, and we're expected uh, to produce recommendations to the president before the end of the year. And uh, that is what we're going to do, because that's our charge. So uh, your help, uh, those of you who are watching on the web, those of you who are following the work of the commission, those of you who came today, we welcome all of you and ask you to be active participants in what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I, I want to close my remarks that way, see if there are any commissioners have any further comments they would like to make. Uh, we will um, have a long session in Florida next week. It's going to start early in the morning and go into the late into the day and hope you can uh, follow that as well. But I'll pause here to see if there's any further comments. Ben? No, just many thanks for attending and uh, we look forward to, um, to all of your, your uh, suggestions, input and uh, studies. Thank you very much.